of the Ultimate Creative Podcast. I'm your host, Emily Milling, and I'm here today with my super cool pal, Stephanie Cook. Yeah! Stephanie, thank you so (laughs) much for being here today and for doing an interview with me. Stephanie is a writer, a podcaster, a creative mastermind genius, and uh, I asked her on the show to talk about her creative career journey and talk about how podcasting has helped her with that. Uh, Steph, I want you to take it away. Tell us everything in a nutshell. Who is Stephanie Cook? Oh, there's so many things. Uh, So currently, I am a comic book writer and a comic book editor primarily. Um, I have a couple books coming out in the next little while, three of them to be exact. Um, And realistically, uh, that journey for me really began with podcasting. Uh, So before I knew I really wanted to be a writer and an editor and like an actual professional capacity, I got involved in, you know, uh, like com- the, the comic book world, realistically, by critiquing and being a part of that whole thing in podcasting. I was on a regular weekly show and uh, we would interview people, talk about like recommendations, picks of the week, talk about things going on in the world, you know, like a comic book show. Uh, And I did that for like a long time. I think I was on the show for like three or four years doing a weekly podcast and it spun off into other shows and other things. But like, it was a really big part of my life for a very long time. And after that, uh, I, I kept on doing different kind of podcasts. And one of those things that I did uh, was actually with you. Yes. What a coinky dink. Yeah, we met at a podcasting meetup. I think you were still doing that comic podcast at that time. And um, you were almost at the point where you were ready to say goodbye and move on to other things, I think. Um, But yeah, yeah. Tell us about how you started this whole idea of the radio play that we did together. Because, I mean, I kind of know the story because I was part of it. But also, I don't know where your idea came from and how you got it going. Yeah, for sure. So um, again, around this time that I was kind of wrapping up the comic book podcast and the other things that I was doing, I was starting to feel that itch for like creative stuff that I wanted to be working on in writing. And uh, I had just did some work in an anthology, the Toronto Comics Anthology, and I wanted more. Um, Comics is like notoriously really hard to get into as a writer because there's just so many people who also want to do that. I mean, that's the same with most industries. Like it's just so many people wanting to do something cool. And unfortunately, not everybody is going to have that chance to do those things. So I was looking for ways to kind of scratch that itch and make sure that I was kind of having an outlet uh, to, you know, practice my writing, practice, you know, something I was good at and loved podcasting. And I came up with the idea of like a radio play. And as you mentioned, we had been going to like these podcast meetups in Toronto. Um, It was you, me, I mean, there was a lot of other people. And then also Lily, who uh, was a part of the radio project. We will get to that part. But anyways, um, uh, I was like, oh, wouldn't it be fun to do a radio play? Like, that could be a cool thing to do. And I, it came from like this idea of wanting to write and, you know, being able to produce something myself and like put something out into the world, right? Like I don't have to wait for somebody to publish that. I can just do it. And so I was like, this could be fun. This could be, this could be good. And I reached out to you and Lily and I was just like, do you think this is a good idea? And both you and Lily were like, yes, I'm in. (laughs) And, oh, we're easy marks. <laughs> and like originally, I don't even necessarily know if I was like, I, I think I wanted validation in that it was like a fun and good idea, but you were both so into it. And I was like, maybe we have something here. Maybe this could be something great. And um, the three of us collectively have no chill whatsoever. <laughs> and <laughs> individually, collectively, and it just kind of turned into, obviously, we, we 
it's obvious to us, I guess, but not to anyone who's listening to this for the first time, but we were really ambitious. We wanted to do it as a live production and then release it as a podcast and like on a fairly tight schedule, which in retrospect was nuts. It was was actually nuts. Yeah. Like we put so much into that and like we did like tours of venues and we were like all over everything and Lily put together all of this. So many auditions and writing rooms. (laughs) So for anybody, I guess, who is listening and doesn't know about this, we did a radio play called The Five People You Meet in Hell, which was like a comedic kind of like Seth Rogen, James Franco take on The Five People You Meet in Heaven. So it was like, what would you do if like this bad person got damned to hell and didn't understand why. So we wrote a seven part, technically it was like six, so it was like six and a half, but like seven for the seven deadly sins, um, like series of little mini episodes that we performed in front of a live studio audience. And then, yeah, it was an experience. It an sure experience. was. It sure was. Well, one of the things that I thought was really cool was how you ran the um, the original writing rooms and brainstorming sessions. Like you oh, gathered bet, a yeah. whole bunch of people together. Can you um, can you walk us through that process? And do you still do that type of process? Because a lot of your writing is still pretty collaborative, right? Yeah. So that's probably the most collaborative thing that I've done kind of to date. So what we did is like the auditions, we wanted to kind of get anybody who was interested and wanted to kind of involve anyone who just wanted to be a part of it. Um, and we, we put out a call, an open call for writers. And we're basically like, here's the idea for the show. Um, here's like the kind of concept. Come join us if you want to help kind of flesh out this skeleton and like make it into something more. So we gathered a bunch of people together um, in a rat infested bar. Yeah, (laughs) that rat. (laughs) God. Uh, And uh, we basically just sat down and like everybody gave ideas and just kind of was like, what if we did this? What if we did that? Like originally we were aiming to do a three to six episode series and somebody was like, oh, well, you have to do seven for the seven deadly sins. And we were like, Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, let's just double our workload. No problem. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) totally fine. But, like, it did become kind of the structure because it gave us a guideline for each episode that we did. Mm -hmm. And so all these people came in and kind of just threw out all of these ideas and essentially just kind of gave us bullet points of what we could build the story off of. So we gathered to kind of build, again, the skeleton and then... uh, me and a couple other people. I, I can't. Did you write it up? What, whatever. Anyways, really? we. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we went off separately and uh, did like the actual uh, scripting. So it's it's interesting though. Like I mostly write solo. Like comic books is really interesting because it is very collaborative, but at the same time, it's not. I mean, it definitely is. But like, for instance, I have two book series that are coming out next year. Uh, So one of them is called Oh My Gods. And it's a middle grade book about a girl who winds up going to high school with a bunch of gods and goddesses. So um, with that one, I had a co-writer on the book. So like I scripted the story, but Insha was kind of like, she helped develop all the characters and the world and did like a lot of like the building there. Uh, so, you know, we worked together to kind of like do the dialogue. Like she's really, she's, she's a Ute. So she was more in tune with how the Utes talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so she helped a lot with like the dialogue and that sort of thing. And um, we bounced back and forth to kind of build the story together. And then Juliana Moon, who's our artist, was brought on by us when we kind of thought, like the radio play, we were going to have to pitch this show and kind of maybe do it on our own on Kickstarter or something. Uh, But then the book got picked up. But like, we were already really close with Juliana at this time. So basically, that book wound up being really collaborative in the sense that like Juliana keeps us in the loop and like asks us for feedback and that sort of thing. Very like very often. Yeah. Like it's an ongoing process, right? Yeah. Um, but like 
typically she goes to like our editor first. Now my other series like Paranorthern, that's not really the case. Like it is a little bit collaborative in the sense that like I script like, you know, the panels um, and the dialogue and stuff like that. But with that, like my publisher brought on the artist. And so my editor deals with her directly. I don't really get to see any of that kind of like art until it's like ready and then I proof it and kind of see if there's anything that's missing or anything that needs to be added in to kind of help make the story make better sense. Do you do you get to be a part of the uh, selection process for the artist though? Yeah. Uh, so I'm sorry if you're picking up like purring. My cat has like decided that she's going to join in. That's sorry. fine. You got a nice cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so she's like purring into the mic, but Uh, yeah. So originally my agent had kind of warned me to not be really precious about the artist and that whole process because sometimes they'll have in-house artists and they'll have specific people that they have in mind for a project. So like I might have a feel or an atmosphere or something that I kind of want the book to give off and I could give hints of that. But realistically, at the end of the day, it was going to be their choice. So I had like come to terms with that. Um, But my editor was like, fantastic. She's amazing. And she actually just like, was like, what is your dream list? Like, send me all the people you want to work with, we will try and get them. And uh, yeah, it, it was really like collaborative in that sense. So I think it's very dependent on like the team you have and like how willing they are to integrate your feedback. And I was very lucky to kind of land with a bunch of amazing, amazing people to kind of make the book come to life. So tell me a little bit about how, like, like the business side of things, like you mentioned, you have an agent and you have an editor. How do you, how do you amass all of these people around you? What is the process for that? Do you just call, like, do you cold call people and say like, please take my things or how, how does that happen? Yeah, it's a bit weird and kind of surreal still to kind of be like, oh, yeah, no, like my agent will deal with that. Um, I have like a TV and movie agent too, apparently now. And like, that's bonkers to me. Um, But like, for so my my agent is named Maria. She's amazing. And um, a few years ago, I had actually, I've been building up contacts and networking in comics for a very, very long time. As I mentioned, I, again, did a podcast and I started networking with people way back then and built up a really good faith relationship with a lot of creators and a lot of people who are now, who weren't necessarily big then, but are like coming up now. Um, So I was podcasting probably from about like, I don't know, 2010 to like 2014 thereabouts, like with this one specific podcast and kind of doing kind of spinoff things and such. So I had started kind of pitching, oh my gods, like I thought that was a really fun idea. We had an artist, we had preview pages ready. So I had done some work, like pitching it to publishers and trying to get a foot in the door that way. And um, in comic publishers, you don't need an agent. So the thing with comic publishers, and as much as I love the industry, it is very predatory. They want people who specifically don't have agents and don't have somebody who's going to negotiate a better rate because they want the people who are fresh out of college and want the work and will work for less. It is, again, like many other industries, it's not great. Um, Things are getting better, but it has moments where it's not great. Um, So again, I was making some headway kind of like pitching this book myself. And I happened to kind of run into um, an editor at a book publisher on my own. And she had been a former comic book publisher, or editor rather, and kind of went to me and said, like, I would deal with you. Like, that's not an issue. I know how to deal with like creators and stuff like that. And they'll let, but like my publisher won't deal with you. You need to have an agent if you want to move further with this. And I'm interested. Uh, so I had networked with Maria, who is my agent, several years ago on a project that just ultimately didn't take off. It just didn't kind of turn into, come to fruition. 
Uh, so we stayed in touch and kind of just kind of kept following each other and hoping to kind of turn into, find a project that could turn into something together down the line. So I came to her with Oh My Gods and told her I had some interest with it. And typically there's a different way to kind of go about this. Like you'd have to kind of query the agent and there's some very specific kind of avenues you need to take for that, in, for, for comics specifically. Um, querying a comic book is a lot different than querying for like a novel with a manuscript. You, she actually, my agent, Maria, wrote up a whole piece on how to query if that's, you know, something you are interested in. Um, her name is Maria Vicente. And if you look up how to query a graphic novel, you can read all about it. And it's well laid out and super, actually really interesting to learn about. Um, but anyways, yeah. Uh, so anyways, yeah, she read the project and talked to the person who was interested. And basically we signed on. I had like a couple other projects. Shockingly, I have no chill. Um, and she began basically um, as, on as my agent and helped get both of those things sold. So yeah, I have that, but um, my editor is actually the same editor for both books. She had bought Paranorthern um, off of Maria, which is my other series, which is about um, a, a young witch in a supernatural alternate earth where there's, you know, like wolf hybrids and like pumpkin head kids and ghosts and all kinds of cool, spooky stuff, and they have to stop the Ahop Calypse. <laughs> and that is a whole bunch of bunnies come through uh, a portal to another dimension and wreak havoc on their world. Oh so, my god. <laughs> um, <laughs> all of my books revolve around puns. This is so funny. Um, <laughs> all of them. Uh, so she had bought that one, uh, and basically we finished work on it and she asked if I had other projects and so um she loved the concept for oh my gods and also bought that one too so I had developed like a I'd like to think I developed a good relationship with my editor in being really professional meeting my deadlines integrating notes and you know just taking all of her feedback and making sure that each draft I did of it was better and then it turned into her wanting to work with me more. Uh, so that's kind of how I built those things up in a very long winded answer. Yeah, no, but it's good though. It's like people want to know and understand like, how do you get from point A to point B? Like when, when you're starting something or you're beginning your career, like how do you get to the point where you have sold a couple of books and you're now finishing them and moving on to more projects. Um, it sounds like the podcast was a really good way for you to build momentum with your network and your career overall. Um, so were there any, like, were there any specific things you did with the podcast or like, I know you did a lot of extra marketing for us for the radio play as well. Uh, and it was always like mind blowing. Cause you're like, Oh, I know this guy. I know this guy. I'm just going to ask them to share it out. And I'm like, what, how did we get ourselves like retweeted by the guy that does the voice of Hermes on, is it Hermes on Futurama? Oh yeah. 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 Phil Lamar. <laughs> That's yeah, that guy. What? How did you even do that? Phil Lamar is a huge comic book nerd. <laughs> and like you, you do a lot of um, uh, Twitter. Like you're on Twitter all the time, and you have uh, a pretty substantial following. Could you elaborate more on like how you how you get stuff out there? Maybe through your 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 personal branding, like your social media, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I think you were kind of talking about like building a brand and like podcasting and networking that sort of thing, but like. So I, I used to write when I was podcasting, I lived in Prince Edward Island when I first started podcasting and I was writing for a movie website and I was doing news and I was doing uh, reviews and sometimes columns too. Um, so this was before the pay per click kind of formula that's now a standard for a lot of like online journalists. Um, but at the time I knew it was potentially kind of coming and like even though I just got paid kind of a base rate, I was afraid, like, if I didn't have a following and they went to pay per click, like, I would have no way to kind of 
you know, get my work out there. So I began the process of trying to build up a brand. I've like most people, I think, have a favorite writer or a favorite artist or whatever. And the same kind of goes for like journalism too. You have certain people that after a while, like if you peruse one specific website, you know the writing of certain people. And you tend to follow people that you know, you either like what they say, you like how they write it or whatever. So I wanted to kind of build that up. Um, I began kind of following all the people that I felt were in kind of my vein of, you know, what I wanted to be doing, who I wanted to kind of surround myself with and just worked on befriending them, networking and interacting with them whenever I could. Um, and like, I still just remember, you know, like spending so much time like in tabs and kind of just like following people and being like, oh yeah, wow, great. Like, you know, like being positive and commenting and just trying to like make friends with people and, you know, promoting my work and just trying to learn how to share and brand and that sort of thing. So yeah, like podcasting kind of happened alongside this writing job. And I knew that I was going to have to up my game. Like I wasn't just going to have to promote my writing. I was going to have to promote a podcast. And, you know, now I was a person on this podcast that had opinions. I have a lot of opinions. It'll be on my tombstone. It'll just say, I have opinions and I do. Um, so, you know, it was just trying to kind of like build up a personality and share a lot of who I was, but like also then in writing form. Um, yeah. And just kind of making sure that like, like being gracious and saying thank you to people who take the time to be like, Hey, I listened to this show. Like, this was great. I love this part, like blah, blah, blah. And like really paying attention to the social aspect of social media. I can't tell you how many people I unfollow who like, don't ever interact back with you. Like, if, if you don't want to like talk to people on social media, you're like missing yeah, the well, point. Well, it's having done social media for brands and I'm like, I'm sure you have as well. It's like, it's like pulling teeth. Cause it's like, you can't have a, any sort of a personality as just like a logo. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like having a personal brand, it's so different. Like, and I'm, I'm totally rebranding everything with the ultimate creative right now. And it's just like, my face versus my logo. And it is making such a huge difference. But also, um, I think this, I think this quarantine has really helped with me, um, socializing on social media. Cause I know like that is the whole principle of it, right? <laughs> like social media is inherently just be yeah. social, but I'm missing being social with people in real life right now. So I started making friends with people on Instagram. <laughs> I don't know how, but now I have more friends I guess Why so. Not? It's uh, but it's really it's really interesting that you like you figured that out probably way before a lot of other people did, like many many moons ago. But we won't say how old we are. <laughs> and we're just young flowers. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's fine. I'm. I don't think I would want to be in my twenties again. I'm proud of where I am now. I've done like so much, and like I I really think if I had pursued writing in a more serious capacity then I would be embarrassed of what I produced so like I'm really happy that you know all things considered podcasting and you know kind of this dabbling in movie criticism and comic criticism and all this stuff kind of happened during that time so I could figure out what I wanted to be saying how I wanted to be saying it and just finding my voice before I took that into the fiction that I'm writing. So, you know, I lived, I have a lot of crazy stories. As I do know, know that. <laughs> and they, almost all of them at some point in time are going to make it into the stories. And I like that at this point in time, I've lived and now I can just be a crotchety hermit and just, like, write about those things that I already experienced. Yeah. Well, you had a podcast briefly called Weird Stories, didn't you? Didn't I do the theme song for that? The Weird Magnets. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. 
my co-host got really sick, so we wound up, like, not being able to do more of it at the time. But, like, I want to do it still so badly. It's really good, it so Really fun. good stories. Really bizarre stories. Really enjoyable stories, though. Yeah. Got broken up yeah, with by a stranger. Just, <laughs> that's so bizarre. Yeah. yeah, yeah oh, yeah, my yeah. God. Okay, so, well, on that sort of thread... Um, you you take on a lot of projects. You like to do a lot of things. You constantly have something new happening, but at the same time, you're also really good at knowing how to say goodbye and like, I must move on to do this other thing. How do you know when it's time to move on? And, and what are some of your like, your internal tip offs? Like, how can you, how do you under, what's a better way to say this? Like, are there any things that you notice like behaviors that start happening or you start feeling a certain way. What's, what gets you to the point where you're ready to say, oh, I'm, I'm ready to be done now. I am admittedly like touch and go with this. So a lot of the time, like I kind of, I thrive in chaos. I love a project. I really do. And it's been a fine line with kind of just trying to, you know, like, want to be busy and like juggling a lot of different things and then just kind of like being overburdened. So I I haven't really talked about this a lot yet, but like I'm also a comic book editor. So I work on a few different series and all of them with the exception of one are monthly, um, which are all kind of on hold right now because of circumstances. But um, I get asked a lot to kind of consult on indie books and kind of like things that people are taking to Kickstarter or other places, that sort of thing too. And my inclination, I always want to help people. Like I always want to be a part of people's projects. Like editing is a different kind of satisfying than writing or podcasting or whatever, you know, kind of helping somebody. And I imagine you actually relate to this too with helping people and like being able to see somebody's vision that you think is like solid and good and helping them make it great is really rewarding and enjoyable. And I really love that about editing. So for me, I guess, uh, jumping back into this, like knowing my limits is a bit difficult because sometimes like I do want to be juggling a lot of projects and with editing, there's not always something, there's not something happening all the time. Um, so I take on things kind of being like, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I can do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then all of them have a moment where, like, I get stuff for them at once. And I'm like, oh, no, what have I done? This is this is too many projects. Why did you take all of these on? And it's trying to then juggle all of these things that normally don't interfere with each other, but, like, you know, again, have come together in this perfect storm to kind of make my life miserable for a few weeks. Um, So it's kind of about just trying my best to make sure that when I take on a project that they're not kind of overlapping too much. Like with editing, you can take on quite a few things at once as long as like the schedules work out. But if I have a book, that's a different monster entirely. And, like, I've really had to start saying no to things with those public publications kind of taking precedence over everything else. Um, you know, like, a publisher has, like, you know, signed a contract with me and said, you know, we need this by a certain time handed in. And it's not just, you know, like, one issue of a comic book is typically, like, 21, 22 pages long. The publisher is asking for like 200 plus pages. So, you know, you have to set aside a pretty decent amount of time for that. And it takes up a lot of your time. So kind of knowing my limits and what I can take on, you know, outside of that without affecting what I'm doing for this main project um, is key. Because, like, again, like, I want my editor to enjoy working with me. I want my agent to think that I'm a superstar, that they can sell my work and kind of be like, she can get stuff done and, like, it's quality in this. And if I have too many things going on, that's messing with my bottom line and with my brand, ultimately. 
Um, I've really learned that while I love editing other people's stuff, I hate editing my own stuff. I hate it. I can like write 200 pages in a fairly decent amount of time. But then when somebody comes back with notes and is like, great, we think you should change this part. Like, it'll break my brain. Like, I need to process and try and figure out how do I take this out? How do I rework it? How do I change the other parts of the story to kind of make this all line up? And so again, making sure that I don't have things that take me out of those modes um, is really vital to me. This kind of stuff is really helpful. Understanding how people are able to accomplish different things and manage a whole lot of different priorities. This is totally what the entire show is about. It's what the ultimate creative is about because like uh, you've met me, it's basically what I'm about. So I completely understand it. Like I'm always grappling, trying to figure out what I can say no to, what I can take on. And then there again, like it's messing with my bottom line or my brand. And I'm like this, you know, this project has nothing to do with what I want to do. Why on earth am I doing it? Um, I always tend to learn the hard way after the fact, um, but I'm starting to like pick up on little things in advance. Like if I'm immediately feeling like, oh, I don't want to do that, even though it's like, oh, that's a couple thousand dollars. I'm like, no, I can make a couple thousand dollars some other way and I'm going to have to figure it out because I don't want to be miserable for the rest of my life, you know? I know, I know, I know. Tell me, Stephanie. Hello, Emily. If you were like, if you were giving advice to young you about your career journey and like you already know what you went through and young you is like, oh my God, I don't know what to do right now. What would you say to make your young brain feel at ease? I guess like <clears throat> when I was young, than I currently am. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but when I was younger, like I felt really aimless. So I dropped out of college after a year. I took, you know, I liked what I was doing, but I didn't feel like it would be my career. Spoilers, it wasn't. Um, and I felt really aimless. Like I had a lot of passions and I had a lot of things I wanted to do. And I just kind of floated around from job to job. I was really miserable and I was like, am I ever going to kind of find something that will make me happy? Am I ever going to find this outlet? Am I ever going to just settle down and just, you know, not feel so aimless? And while I still kind of feel aimless sometimes, all of those things have ultimately led me to here. And that sounds really hokey and silly, but like, a lot of those very specific things that I thought were these detours in my life or just kind of strange hobbies I would pick up or, you know, just kind of like just random jobs and just all these things that I never thought would amount to anything more than what they were at the time all kind of turned into something great. So in comics, especially for like people who are self-publishing, kickstarting, crowdfunding, that sort of thing. And even just pitching yourself to editors and collaborators and stuff. One thing that you need is a sales mind. You need to be a salesperson. You need to be able to sell yourself. You need to have customer service abilities to kind of just put yourself out there. And well, I feel like I am an extrovert, introverted extrovert. Um, retail over the years definitely taught me to like put that face on the extroverted face and just be like, here, do you want to buy this? Do you want to buy this? Do you want to buy this? And like, maybe I don't like actually like this band, but like you definitely will like what? And all of that stuff has really, again, even just retail has come back to be ex exceedingly helpful to me as, you know, someone who's trying to build a brand for themselves because I know how to sell something even when that imposter syndrome is selling, telling me that like you aren't worth anything. Like there's always going to be moments like that. Spoilers, it sucks, but like there's always, always, always going to be that looming fear that you're not worth it. And sometimes being able to just fake it 
is a huge skill that you wouldn't have thought you would need. I think I think that's a pretty good takeaway from from a lot of people who have done retail, like me included. It's just figuring out how to fake it. I mean, as long as you have the energy to, because there would be so many days where I would just be like, I don't like fucking want to work for the gap. Goodbye. And I like would storm out and be a stupid idiot and leave people in a lurch. And those were not my greatest days. But, you know, I did learn how to how to fake it to to be able to sell other things. And then you're right. It does translate into learning how to be being learning how to sell yourself. End of statement. (laughs) Yeah. And like, I know that's kind of minimal, but like. All of those things came together to ultimately really just like help me. And I feel like just between the skills I learned and the experiences I've had, they've lent themselves to what I do so well. And again, like even retail is just being around people. And there's so many stories that I take from those days and infuse into the characters I write and into you know, the dialogue and into the personas and just like straight up also the stories. Um, So, you know, like, I think sometimes people forget, like, it's like, oh, what do you do? Oh, I just, I just, I'm just a salesperson. You're not just a salesperson. Like, there's so much more to that. And every single job and every single experience is what you make of it and what you take from it. And there's no job in the entire world that doesn't require a skill and what you choose to develop, you know, within those jobs or within those experiences or whatever is up to you. Also end of statement. (laughs) End of statement. (laughs) Done. It's up to you. You heard it. It is up to you. Stephanie Cook. (laughs) Oh, no, that's really good. I think I think everything you're sharing is just so insightful and so helpful. And I, I really love that you take such a business focused approach to everything too. Like it's not just about creating, it's about the ability to get it in the hands of people that want it and and make money from it. Because like we don't want to be starving artists. We want to be artists that eat and live comfortably, <laughs> frankly, I think. You know, it's um, it's very difficult, I think, for a lot of people who are creative to find, um, to be able to value their artistic abilities um enough to put a to put a dollar amount on it uh as and even like especially like freelancers graphic designers um illustrators like i find that obviously because there's so much um there's so much of this like exposure like paying you an exposure thing that has been going on for however long that it's now become the norm and we don't feel comfortable putting a dollar value on our work but like it is highly valuable stuff like you can't sell an amazing piece of technology without some fabulous marketing behind it. You know what I mean? You, and marketing requires a lot of creativity and a lot of these artistic skills, um, that, you know, music, design, whatever the F you need. So, and that was another thing that you did too. You created a whole website, like a portal for, um, for artists to be able to uh, yeah. connect with each other. Is that still going on? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I do run like two websites. One's called Creator Resource, which is a, a, it's just basically exactly what it sounds like. It's resources and tools for freelancers with a specific kind of focus on comic book creators. But it's basically everything or as much as possible uh, of what they could potentially need to better navigate the comic book industry. And I have a sister site to that called Creator Advisor, which is essentially a service that allows people to connect like with other creators that might be looking to create a paid project for them to work and collaborate on. So like for me, I have a pretty decent network at this point in time. I can find artists pretty well on my own, but not everybody has that network. And somebody with like 70 followers isn't going to be able to get their, you know, I want to work on this book and I will pay somebody to like do the art for it. Like their ad isn't going to get out or their like tweet is not going to reach as many people. So I help connect those creators looking to not take advantage of, you know, starving artists, 
and I help them find their dream team. That's so good. Yeah. Is that like, is that also an income stream for you or is that more of a passion project? It's more of a passion project right now because again, I take tips. We have like a Patreon for it and stuff, but typically I would like for the people who are requiring or asking for my help to pay that money to their artists. And like, I do it on a kind of time basis, like whether I can kind of do personalized recommendations or signal boost it. Like, you know, obviously doing personalized recommendations takes a lot more time. And usually I say like, it's nice if they tip, but like, you don't have to, but like I can definitely obviously signal boost something for free. Um, but like a lot of people are really good in the industry. They recognize, you know, how hard it can be to connect, how hard it can be to find a good, you know, person. And I've had like a lot of like creators be like, oh, I'll give you 15%. And I'm like, I'm not an agent. Like, that's really nice. But like, you don't have to do that. So I know in theory, I should probably look to monetize that into something more, you know, lucrative and kind of talking about not taking advantage of the things we do, (laughs) but like, I, you know, I want to help people and like connect those people who need that income more. I have a day job also that allows me to kind of have a steady, you know, way to pay my rent, pay my bills. So being able to help in the comic book community is like my way of giving back. That's so nice. (laughs) I just want to help people. It's so nice though. Okay, Steph, tell everybody where they can find you. Plug all of your things. Every single thing. Thank you. Oh my. (laughs) Okay. Well, I just have a brand new redesigned website at stephaniecook.ca and cook has an E on the end of it. So it's like cook E, but without the I. And now we're just getting very, very, very tricky. stephaniecook.ca. Um, and then on pretty much everywhere, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, my username is Hello Cookie, but like the actual yum yum cookie. The actual yum yum <laughs> I'm cookie. I'm just making things. <laughs> the actual yum yum cookie. <laughs> okay. As opposed to cook with an E. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This one is actually spelled out. <laughs> nice. And, and you have books coming out soon, right? Yeah. So um, we're currently waiting on some dates due to the situation happening right now with this little pandemic. Uh, So, oh my God, book number one is fall 2020. uh, And then Paranorthern is spring 2021. Um, And yeah, I'm I'm editing a book called Tartarus at Image Comics um, with a couple creators, Johnny Christmas and Jack Cole. That's a lot to look forward to. I have no chill whatsoever. No, I I would never expect you to. I'd be really concerned if you didn't have 50 things happening, honestly. Likewise. (laughs) So is there anything else um, that you want to share before we wrap up our conversation? That's not how you say conversation. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just think, you know, it's okay to feel aimless. It's okay to feel like you don't know what you're going to do. Um, but if you're doing projects for yourself, first and foremost, creative things or whatever, if you're doing something out of a passion for it and because you love it, that is going to resonate with whoever you are reaching out to, whether it's one reader, one listener on your podcast, whatever medium you're working in, if you are doing it for yourself and putting a little piece of you into it, that's going to make all the difference in the world. 